Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Please take a seat. We'll get started. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Those of you in the room and those of you online, thanks for joining us. Really glad to have you here. My name is Betty Garcia. I lead uh, communications here at IQDAR, the Institute for Integrative and Innovative Research. And uh, Dr. Ron Jung, who is our executive director, is traveling. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to the last event in our fall speaker series. Um, thank you again for being here. Um, it's going to be a, a really great program this morning. Um, just a, a little bit about IQ Dark. There are um, five sort of defining concepts that uh, Dr. John loves to remind us of. Um, that, that really define the work that we do here at IQ DAR. Um, the first is integration. There's innovation. Both of those are reflected in our name. Um, then there's convergence, really important concept for how we do work around here at scale and economic development. And all of those are actually reflected in our mission statement. Driven by purpose, we pioneer solutions to wicked problems through convergence research across academic, industry, government, nonprofit sectors to make a positive societal impact by creating and deploying innovations at scale. And we're going to hear about some of that work this morning. Last week, um, we uh, heard from Dr. Meredith Atkins from the um, from, from IQDAR and a team of researchers um, doing convergence research. Um, on a project called I Cultivate IQ. And today, you know, and that project is changing, you know, regional food systems, creating more resilient food systems, uh, creating a model for that, um, and how we that can, that can impact rural economies, uh, how it impacts small and mid sized farmers, and how it also impacts institutional um, buyers, um, food buyers. So really important research. We're going to dig into that a little bit more, the underlying research um, around um, that project here in our first presentation. Um, again, this is um, the last event in our fall speaker series, and it's um, we say the best for last. We are going to be hearing from our grad students, grad students here at IQ DAR and the research that they're doing. Like I said, the first presentation. We'll explore, we'll sort of follow what we've heard last week in our speaker series, and then we'll hear about other really important work that's happening here at the Institute. And I'll kick it over to Philip Sample, who um, will set the, the framework for our um, event today and introduce our speakers. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the final installment of this year's Thank You to Our Speaker Series. Um, I'm Philip Sample, project manager here at IQDAR, and I have the pleasure of introducing these four amazing grad students um, who are working on different projects in biomedical, virtual reality, and technology research, uh, supporting innovation here at the University of Arkansas. And innovation is a team sport, and all of these students are contributing in significant ways to their project whether it's software development, neural stimulation, medicine, rehabilitation. Today, each student is going to present on their work and um, take questions from the audience. You may notice that uh, our, our three speakers that will, will uh, close out the, the morning here are all in bioengineering and biomedical uh, research. So we're going to bundle all the questions for them at the end. Um, but we'll lead off with Ben. Uh, who is an MBA uh, candidate at Walton School of Business and graduate research assistant with Cultivate IQ. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this uh, very, you know, inspiring project. Uh, uh, I think it's going to be one of the projects which will change the agricultural sector. And before I start, let me acknowledge the good people and well-known well people on this great team. And I start with Professor Meredith. I have our project manager and now <laughs> uh, Philip Simba. We have the likes of Professor Chase. We have uh, Christian, Professor Christian. We have uh, Professor Nauli. And uh, uh, we have our partners, which is uh, Burns and him. 
which uh, which is really a great team to you know to be part of. So then I am just a tiny at the bottom, just helping. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I also will recognize our MBA director, uh, Professor Adams is also here, and I'm really honored to have him here because uh, I'm just learning, you know, something from him, and he's here, and I'm speaking here, so I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> you got this. <laughs> yeah, but I'm going to try my best and then uh, demystify this uh, presentation. Okay, so. Uh, this is actually the topic, but the whole thing is actually Portuguese IQ, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the research or the, uh, the engine behind all these, you know, big projects that we're still working on, which is going to change the agriculture sector. Good. So let me talk a little bit about myself. This is a fraction about my CV. So <laughs> this is me here. So, uh, I started off as, uh, as a curious person trying to learn more about engineering, so started my bachelor's in information technology and moved to another level, which was computer engineering somewhere in Nigeria University in China. So started from Ghana, went to China, did a computer engineering, came back to the US, Texas, do computer science again. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a dictionary here. So, <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm actually in the MBA program, the best program in the United States, being chaired and directed by our boss, Mr. Adams. And I have a little bit of uh, interest in uh, talking about my you know, work experience because uh, I've had a ton of uh, uh, work experience in, in, in engineering specifically. But uh, I started off from being a teaching assistant where that was my undergraduate, then I was being coached into a big time to media where I was the lead software engineer working there for a little while before I went back to school. And then during my computer engineering, I had opportunity to go intern with the Yamaha in, in Japan, uh, which was really great working with you know, innovations, working with simulations and all that, uh, how real mechanical engineering works and all that, which was really good experience. Then I, after finishing my computer engineering, I went back to work with Baidu. Baidu is the number one search engine in Asia. It's just like the middle of our time and uh, working with Choppy and all that. So I was actually working on a big campus where we are simulating things like flying cars, things like automated uh, moving cars and all that. So it was a really great environment which I went. So uh, working there for a while, I wanted to go back to school and I'm like, okay, I'm determined between PAD and MBA. I'm like, I, I want to know more about business. So I applied to Walton College and lo and behold, I had a great email from Mr. Adams, which changed my whole, you know, my whole day and demeanor for business. And I'm like, ah, let me just go for it. So that is why I'm here. Through that, I had a GA, and the watching college, which was really good. And then after that, I'm here with I3. But what I love about working with I3 gives you the corporate environment. It gives you the innovation and discovery kind of, you know, intelligent people out here talking to everybody gives you some, you know, level of knowledge. And then the teamwork and the learning is the greatest part here. Okay. So, uh, what is all this about? Why cultivate IQ? So, Cultivate IQ, I know uh, uh, Meredith and the team have talked about this more, but uh, let me start from here so we can really follow and understand what I'm about to talk about today. So, uh, upon a series of uh, research and interviews and all of that, there was a huge pro uh, problem in the agriculture sector where small farms and then food hubs have uh, uh, they don't have any aggregated data where they can actually go find and then make some informed decisions in what to do next, what to do, and all of you. So this is actually going to solve that problem. So in our research, what intrigued me is we have a really huge market for this. 
So when we look at software as a service in the agricultural sector, from the year 2020, uh, the market size and the money people or agricultural people spend on this is really huge. That is about 8,000, oh, 800 million, sorry. And looking at this and forecasting into the future, which is going to be about $2,000 million for only software as a service. Let's forget about the equipment as a service. So we can see there's a bigger market. If you are in business, you know this is a huge thing to tap into. So this gives it a, a really more reason why we should actually come with this project, which will you know, help the whole you know, uh, uh, food system. So let's go to the next one. But diving deep into it and looking at all these segments of uh, softwares be which are being used with agriculture sectors, we came to conclusion that there is a missing gap here. So starting from here, we have the precision agriculture where you know most people focus on uh, agriculture best practices and all that. Then we come to the farm inventory that is managing the farm using like uh, ERP systems, CRM and all that just to manage the uh, agricultural supplies and equipment. Then we come to the farming communities uh, segment which deals with connecting farmers with each other, you know, in terms of just wanting to know the expertise, the, the shared knowledge they have and all that. Then we come to the general purpose. General purpose is simply a combination of two or three of this segment together in order to provide the platform for the agri sector. But the top one is where ultimate IQ actually falls in, where it's actually the smallest in the, in the segment. So this is more or less like using technology to forecast prices for the farmer, and then the consumer demand analyze profit of the, of the marketing channels and all that, which is really huge. Because if you have no data to actually work with, how can you get your profit? How can you actually make well-informed decisions? So this is where Cultivate IQ actually, you know, generated from. Then let's look at what is this platform we are talking about. It's very simple. It's about using AML to provide a data insight in order to inform small farmers, food hubs, and then other stakeholders who are interested in all these agriculture stuff. So it's going to do a different the marketing data to help make decisions, to help make decisions. And this is really geared for the small farmers, so because they, they are the smallest and they don't have money to, you know, uh, employ business analysts and all that. Then we also focus in on local food distributors here. So let's look at the AI aspect and ML and uh, what have you and how this actually fits in into Cultivate IQ. So let's look at the uh, upper level of what it means for you to say you are using AI, what it means for you to say ML, deep learning, and all that. But uh, let me explain it in a simple layman way. For when we talk about AI, you have heard of it a lot. I know most of our engineering here knows about it, but for those who does not really know about it, AI is simply what uh, a dedicated science which is actually helping computers to make better decisions. But the most crazy aspect of it is it mimics human behavior and the patterns, the character, and other stuff, which makes it more dangerous here when it's not really controlled. <laughs> but the machine learning aspect is just a subset, a subset of the AI, which is, uh, which is using, uh, let's say, it's using simple algorithms to help make these decisions more better. So it's an option or a subset of the AI, which is helping to make this decision. But what, what is good here is uh, this ML works without what? Explicitly not what? Programming it. So that means it can learn on its own and then do other stuff. Then we have the deep learning controlling 
what the outcome of the uh, result of the AI. If it is wrong, then it can help and correct it. Then, so let's go into this. So this is the powerhouse for the AI that is using the machine learning. So how do machine learning actually work? It's very simple key uh, technologies we need to look here. Machine learning only works based on train algorithms, so we call it the ML model. The ML model, what it does is you need to feed in data, and this data is being trained. And if it's being trained, then this combination, data and algorithm coming together, we, we get what we call the ML model. So mathematically, ML model is what? It's simply training times the data plus what? Algorithms. That is what? Machine learning. Very simple. Then we have, what, what do we call this on supervised, supervised and reinforced learning? But before we can actually achieve cultivate IQ with uh, our partner called Vance the Junction AI, they will I really appreciate this. Good. We have to have a better way of actually predicting our data to our users. But how would we do that? We we'll do that using one of these selected good algorithms which will help us. But let's take this for example. Unsupervised, supervised, and reinforced. Okay, this is a broader or general way of uh, you know classifying the algorithm how they are being trained. So when we take unsupervised learning, it's simple providing data in algorithms which has no guidelines. So it just take the raw data and then it start learning from the data. Then here, supervised means it has some form of uh, controls where, for example, if you give it this might be good, this might be bad. For example, if we want to determine uh, the machine, we want the machine to determine cuts and all that, then we can give it a picture of several cuts to be actually to know that, okay, this, when I see this picture, is actually cut. So we have reinforced, reinforced, which is the baddest one because it actually uses the try and error, but it's using game AI and other, so it's actually good for that. So we start with a clustering. Clustering is very good in uh, recommending systems and targeted markets and customer segmentation. So this is mostly used in our social media and it's a wicked algorithm. Because when you watch the Netflix series called The Social Dilemma, you really understand what this means. It's, it's helping the recommendation system where you keep scrolling on Facebook. It gives you, tells you your friend, your video on YouTube, it tells you the next video to watch and all this. This is the secret behind those, uh, you know, recommendations. So it works in conjunction with the recommendation algorithm. Now we look at the reduction. The reduction also helps in a meaningful compression structure, discovery, and, and other. So these algorithms are mostly using helping you update your OS. For example, if your computer tells you your your browser is out of, is outdated, or you need to upgrade to the next version. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this algorithm also helps in this big data and uh, uh, determining that. And then we have the classification, which is uh, uh, grouping data into several points, which help you to also help with fraud detection and others. So any email spam you have is also having this algorithm behind it because it differentiated all that and tells you which one is big. But what we want, I want us to concentrate is this regression. And this is the core of our project. Because regression here is uh, actually the algorithm which will help us to do what? Forecast. One of our, of our, platform, our platform main goal is to help farmers forecast what? The future. So they can make one, good decision, two, gain more profits. Then we have predictions, which will also give the predict, uh, predicts, you know, other form, and then we have the process optimized, and then the new insights. Okay, good. So now that we have our mind square, this is the whole process for cultivating IQ. The first one is we need to identify useful data, where useful data will be they are related to agriculture. So, for example, we need to tap into USDA data, we need to tap into 
Now, so we need to tap into all these big data uh, data set. Then it can use this data connection to format and modify the data. And uh, this can be in a form of processing the data through APIs and others. We have the type of exploration that is differentiating between the good and bad data. Then it comes to the data preparation for the ML algorithm where it actually categorizes and uses the regression or classification algorithm. Then we train the ML. Here comes what? Our dashboard. And the dashboard is going to actually predict the market and consumer inside where farmers and food have to ask questions, just like chat GB, but this is going to be by the culture. Where they can ask questions and then, you know, get the answer straightforward and predict uh, prediction for the what for produce in high demand, current pricing data, and then have the cost of what production and analysis. Thank you for listening to my short presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I <can't remember. laughs> Thank you, Ben. And Ben, will you be able to stick around later yeah. if anyone has questions? Um, sure. We'll, we'll do those uh, at the end. At the end. Uh, that's good. Uh, next up, Lasso. So, hello, everyone. Um, <coughs> as the title said, my name is Tomas Benini. I'm going to do a pretty short presentation on peripheral nerve simulation to restore sensation to people who have lost uh, their limbs. Um, a very short and a little bit less professional introduction about myself. And like I said, my name is Tomas Benini. I'm a first generation Italian American. Uh, I come from a very good family where I learned to cook a lot of very good Italian food. And I like telling people and teaching people how to cook Italian food. Um, I recently got married and I really like this picture because my youngest brother, I don't know if you can see it, but he made me an axe. Uh, <laughs> and he did it to me at the wedding and it shocked my father in law, and so I thought it was a very bad <laughs> Um, I graduated with a uh, bachelor's in biomedical engineering and mechanical engineering at Florida International University. And I think the thing that ties it all together and why I got into this topic and in general and what I'll be speaking about today is really I remember when I was a little kid watching The Empire Strikes Back and watching this scene right here where Luke gets a, a new hand and he gets the feel on his head. I'm like, and I remember asking after I finished my, my bachelor's, like, who's doing this right now? Who's researching this? And um, I dug a little bit and I found that Dr. Jones lab was doing this and it happened to be at the same university I had gone to and just came to shut here I am today. Mm -hmm. So the topic that I'll be talking about, I'll be doing a lot of background information about peripheral nerve stimulation. Unfortunately, my specific research is being held up by the patent office, so we uh, <laughs> very little that I speak about it today. But I can talk about the generic part and I think both Ali and Ariana, they have um, components that, you know, a lot of this will help understand that as well. So I'll be talking about the peripheral nervous system in general, how the nervous system communicates, how we can use that communication so that we can take advantage of it and simulate the peripheral nerves to restore sensations to the hand. Then a very specific example that our lab has been working on called the neural enabled prosthetic hand. And then a little bit of what the current limitations are and where my research fits into those current limitations. So um, what is the peripheral nervous system, right? The nervous system we know is divided into two parts. We have the central nervous system, which is the brain, the spinal cord. And then the peripheral nervous system, which is everything that is outside of the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is pretty impressive. Some of the, the cells of the peripheral nervous system can be the longest in the entire body. If you can imagine, there's specific cells that go from the small of your back, a single cell, all the way down to the bottom of your foot. So we're talking about cells that are four feet in length, huge structures that send information from receptors in the feet and every single part of the body back all the way up to the brain. There's many divisions that you can have in the nervous system, and the peripheral nervous system I'll focus on two. Um, the first is the somatic nervous system, which is muscle, controlling muscle and movement, and then also sensation coming back. So what you feel, so pressure, um, position of your body in space, temperature, pain, all of that is part of the somatic nervous system. Then you have the autonomic nervous system, which is then divided into fight or flight, um, and the autonomic nervous system is uh, everything that you don't voluntarily control, so heart rate, hormone release, smooth muscle contraction, things that you don't think about, but your body has to know what's going on. So that's all the autonomic system. Uh, my research in the lab focuses focus more on the somatic nervous system and more on somatic sensation, so the sensory part of the, of the nervous system. So how does the nervous system communicate? We all know that the nervous system is electric. 
But it's not electric like we think of like lifting a battery up to a car. Instead, the electricity, let's say, of the nervous system comes from uh, salt, pretty much. Different salt concentrations on the inside and the outside of your cell, which can be modeled uh, right there, um, for those who want to know. Um, but, so that concentration causes, uh, that, that difference in salt concentration causes a voltage percentage. Because salts are ions, and ions have charge, and all that. Um, so your membrane a potential pretty much rests at a, at a certain point, but you can reach uh, a threshold, an activation threshold, after which there's a sort of all or nothing response in which you get a spike of voltage where all this salt essentially rushes from one side to the other, which changes the voltage drastically and then comes back down and then uh, goes back to normal. That drastic change in voltage is called an action potential. Those action potentials can go up and down. And if you kind of zoom out a little bit, those action potentials kind of look like a spike, or like a one, or a zero. So that is how information is sent. You send a one when there's an action potential, a zero when there's no action potential. Now, the interesting thing about action potentials, right, is that your brain doesn't know where that action potential starts. So it knows that the nerve fiber connecting whatever the sensor right here is, is one nerve fiber, and it's going all the way to the brain. But it doesn't know if the action potential started here because you're pressing on it, or if it started because you put an electrode on your elbow and it's targeting that exact nerve fiber that's going all the way down here. And so you can sort of hijack, let's say, the nervous system to send action potentials to the brain so that the brain thinks, hey, it's coming from the same nerve fiber that I know sends this area, so it must be that area. And we can use that to our advantage to say we can put an electrode anywhere on the body, as in the first row there to then send information to the brain so that we, the brain thinks it comes from that area. This is something that we can use to restore sensation to the hand. So we know, for example, um, the loss of a limb is pretty, pretty traumatic. You know, the somatic sensation, which is the base term for all sensation of touch, for perception, so where your body is pain and temperature, has more receptors in it than the visual or the auditory uh, system. Your hand itself, just the palm of your hand, has four receptors on it while your eyes only have two receptors to tell you about the rods and cones to tell you about all that we can see here. So it's a pretty complex system. So much so that the hand itself corresponds to about 30% of the sensory motor cortex, the part of your brain that processes sensory information and motor information to the hand. So a loss of a hand is a loss of 30% of a functional area. It just stops doing things. So it's a pretty big deal to the person, and it could create a lot of different complex problems later on in life. Um, using peripheral nerve stimulation, we can actually stimulate the hand of people who've lost their limbs. And one of the reasons that I think it's fascinating is because the cell bodies, right, if we think of these super long structures, the cell bodies are actually close to the spinal cord. So even if you get an amputation, the most likely the body of the cell, the nucleus of the cell, is still intact and isn't damaged. So the nerve fiber, it's very possible in recent research, like 10 years ago, showed, yeah, it still works, it's still alive. I personally like peripheral nerve stimulation instead of some things that you've heard of like Elon Musk and stuff that wants to put electrodes in the brain because the peripheral nervous system keeps the integration pathways intact. You know, not all integration happens at the top level of your brain. There is a lot that goes on in the spinal cord and a huge complicated process and integration back and forth that happens in the spinal cord and the brain that peripheral nerve stimulation keeps intact. And so what we think is that that allows for more natural sensations because, you know, it's true that the action potentials are electric, are being generated not in a natural way, but a lot of the integration pathway is intact. Um, and so, how do we actually do this? Let's think about how we could actually create a real world example that could actually help someone. There's a few ways that we're currently that, that's being researched into actually stimulating the nerve. There's a few different electrode types over there. We can put an electrode around the nerve, we can put one inside the nerve, really threaded like a fine wire, so that's touching nerve fibers. Or we can put it through the nerve with a time electrode that goes through and has a bunch of different points that could activate fibers. But you can imagine somebody with a prosthetic without, without a limb that has a prosthetic hand and sensors on it. Those sensors could then go and then uh, be transmitted into stimulation pulses because you don't want to stimulate for three seconds in the nerve. Now you might cause damage. Instead, we're talking about microseconds worth of stimulation. So very, very short pulses. Um, but you stimulate that nerve, then wirelessly you can send that information to an electrode that's inside the, into the nerve, inside the upper arm, and the person can feel as if they're coming, the sensations they're feeling are coming from the prosthetic hand itself. 
In the lab, we've actually created this, so Dr. Doug and Dr. Jimmy, uh, Dr. Abbas, and a bunch of other people in the lab have helped uh, create a neural-enabled prosthetic hand, which is right now in clinical trials, so we're really trying to bring this out, in which we implant electrodes into the upper arm of the person, and wirelessly, we can send information from the prosthetic limb, so you see the antenna right there that goes to the neurostimulator that's inside the arm, so that they can feel sensation on different parts of the hand, not necessarily this part for every single person, but <clears throat> on different parts of the hand, so that when you stimulate the ulnar nerve, which kind of controls this half of your hand, you get sensations on the ulnar nerve. Stimulate the median nerve, you get sensations on the median nerve. So, uh, just to finish up, what is one of the problems that I've seen? Um, a lot of research and a lot of groups, there's, and some of the data down here, have shown that, you know, it doesn't matter for some reason, um, and we don't know exactly why yet, there could be a lot of factors. When you stimulate someone, some people get areas that are very big and overlap. So when you stimulate a certain point, they don't feel a tiny pinprick or a tiny area, they feel a very large area. So if you're trying to say, hey, um, I want to feel something that needs two dimensions, right? And you can only stimulate one dimension of information, that becomes very hard. So if you have one dimension of information, for example, uh, you can't tell me whether you're grabbing a hard block of wood or a carton of milk because you need to know, well, how much force am I putting, how compliant is it, and how big is it? Because those are the two things, pieces of information. You need two. And if you only have one piece of information, you can't do that. And multiple groups have found that some participants, and especially non-invasively, which Ali will speak about, you really only get one area per electrode side. Um, and so... Segwaying into my research, which I cannot present, <laughs> I'm looking at ways of how can I add more information to a single area so that, hey, if someone has this problem, at least they can do most of the complicated, uh, some of the complicated tasks that they can't do. Um, and I think with that, I'll finish my uh, presentation and hand it off and do the next one. Awesome. Thanks, Bonso, for that overview of uh, the work that. Uh, you all are doing around the neural enhanced prosthetic. Um, and now we'll hand it over to Aaliyah to talk a little bit more about applications in VR. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. As Bob said, my name is Aaliyah Shell. And today I'll be presenting my work on extending the sense of touch to virtual reality to promote and improve the sensory functions and sense of presence in VR. Uh, but before I go into the nitty gritty, I just wanted to give you guys a little overview about who I am. I graduated from Rutgers University with a BS in Biomedical Engineering. And while I was there, I was pretty involved. Um, I was a School of Engineering Ambassador. I held a industry position as an R&D co-op on the Packaging Engineering team at MTF Biologics. And that translated into a position as a Packaging Engineer. Uh, I got a little experience in the clinical realm. I worked at a process science place as an engineering intern. And while I was there, I also was a part of a organization, the National Society of Black Engineers. And I served on the executive board as a technical excellence chair, where I had the opportunity to host a variety of outreaches in the community. Uh, in particular, I worked with kids in grades K to 12. And that was probably the highlight mm -hmm. of my college career. And a quick fun fact about myself, I like to consider myself a thrill seeker. <laughs> I love the music parks and fun fact, I've been on over 90 lower. If you love roller coasters, talk to me after. <laughs> so, my long-term goal is to provide support for accessible neural rehabilitation measures that optimize sensory motor function. The World Health Organization estimates that there are 2.4 billion people that live with a condition that could benefit from rehabilitation. And in low-income countries in particular, more than 50% of those people do not receive the rehabilitation care that they require. And this can be due to various reasons. Some of those include financial burdens, some people just can't afford top-of-the-line health care, um, some training and compliance, Sensory motor rehabilitation is an extensive process that often requires several sessions of training to see an improvement in recovery. And the last is a lack of access. I mean, some people in the rural areas, remote areas, and they just can't get to the rehabilitation 
rehabilitation care that they need. And so there has been discussion about, you know, how do we reach these people? And that is where virtual reality comes into play. And some of the benefits of using VR for rehab is that it is a deployable technology. Like I said, we can set it up to the remote areas and reach these populations. And because of that, now people can do that from the comforts of their home. And that can promote training compliance. And lastly, it's a relatively low cost and affordable option. I mean, you can go to Walmart right now and buy that tip. And the significance of this is because of the benefits of VR, uh, this technology may be able to help people who live with sensory motor deficits, for example. Uh, after acquiring the condition, some people are unable to do everyday activities, which can lead to a poor quality of life and, in some cases, lack of independence. And that means that they're dependent on other people to do these tasks for them. And just to touch on the money part for the business people in the audience, <laughs> uh, virtual reality is projected to be a $2.3 million market by 2030. And rehabilitation has been identified as one of the key directions for healthcare with VR. So now that you get a sense of the benefits of using VR for rehabilitation, I want you to try to imagine what your life would be like without touch. We navigate the world through our senses, and touch is like a gateway for us to experience the tactile world that we live in. In current applications of VR, we have a few pieces of feedback available to us. Some of those include our proprioceptive feedback, which is our, our ability to track our limbs relative to our bodies. Uh, visual feedback of things that we are interacting with in virtual environment. And the main focus has mostly been this piece. We have uh, our motor output or motor function. But a key contributor to our planning of movements is actually distance. Such feedback, or as we call it. However, this is something that is still largely missing in VR. And this leads to an incomplete sensory motor loop. And since touch plays an important role in our everyday movements, I think that this is something that hinders the potential of VR as a therapeutic intervention. So if we move towards using VR for rehab, it is important for us to understand how this missing piece is affecting us, especially compared to traditional methods of rehabilitation. So I believe that if we add haptic feedback to virtual reality, that this may lead to us seeing some changes in functional performance and brain activation that is more similar to what we would observe if we are doing these tasks in a physical environment. And so this is like the overarching theme of my PhD, and we'll test this with two specific aims. The first aim focuses on brain activation patterns, and that's mostly a comparison of those activation patterns uh, when we're doing these tasks in a VR space with happy feedback versus doing it in a physical environment with our natural happy feedback, as it will be called in this presentation. And the second aim looks at differences in sensory motor task performance and sense of presence. So some measurements of interest, I have four key pieces. Uh, we're interested in looking at conscious workload, some functional task performance, like I mentioned, uh, sensory motor cortex activity, and sense of presence, of course. And we'll be testing that through two different types of tasks. Uh, the first is a sensory motor exploration task. Think of this as, uh, I don't know, when you're going to Walmart and you're going produce shopping, you pick up different fruits. You squeeze them to see which one that are right is for consumption. That would be an example of a sensory motor exploration task. The other one is a sensory motor functional task. Um, think of it as right now, you guys all have word balls in front of you. You pick it up, you move it over. That could be a functional task. And we try to emulate both of these with tasks that we can do in the lab. So we'll use an object identification task, like identifying those fruits, and a box of box task, which is sitting there picking up that word bottle and moving it over. And our test population, we actually want to test this in people with and without upper limb difference. And you may be asking, well, why? Why people with upper limb difference? And it's mostly because it is, it is a population known to have use-dependent plasticity of the sensory motor hand region, following amputation. Uh, in some cases, they have lingering phantom sensations that can be activated in the simulation. And this is a great opportunity for us to understand how happy feedback may influence activation or maybe possibly plasticity 
uh, of these cortical regions as well as the functional benefits. And so there's three key pieces that we use. The first is neuroimaging. So we're looking at both the electrical and chemodynamic activity of the brain as recorded by both EEG and ethmeres. Of course, virtual reality will be building our environments in-house uh, using Unity. And the last piece, uh, neurohacking feedback, which I mentioned in the previous slide, but I didn't go into great detail, and I think here it is. Um, so we'll be using transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation of the median nerve, and we would deliver this happy feedback through our published and patented technology called Extended Touch, we call it for short. And it is a wearable neurohaptic feedback platform that we like to say extends the sense of touch to virtual and lethal environments. And the, the way that it works is that our goal is to allow you to dynamically interact with virtual objects. And so imagine you have a VR headset on, you're in an environment and there's an object that you want to look out for. The headset will take measurements of your hand aperture, send it into this program that we have, and based on some properties that we give the object in the environment, we can do some calculations of the grass or grass force and deliver some happy feedback that matches that interaction. And this platform makes use of a novel stimulation strategy developed by a professor here at IQ Guard called Chips. And it allows you to feel sensations in your hand, this is your first sensation is what we're stimulating at the wrist, uh, while mitigating any sensations you may feel underneath the electrode. And uh, why is this beneficial? Uh, because now we can give you a hands free experience of interacting with things in a virtual environment while also feeling it. So, this is the technology I'll be using for both of my aims, uh, and here we're currently out in the studies. We just finished a preliminary study where we investigated uh, the difference in the cortical activation when grasping virtual versus physical objects with that neural happy feedback and the natural happy feedback that we, that we discussed earlier. And we use that such more exploration task of so identifying the roots. And we did that with both the virtual and physical objects. And so there was five main regions that we were interested in, three, I guess, but if we break it up into left and right spot, and that was the prefrontal cortex, the sensory motor cortex, and the somatosensory association cortex, which has been associated with tactile recognition of objects. And what we found was that uh, overall there were larger changes in activation in both the sensory motor cortices, the species, and the somatosensory association cortex that are in physical object grass. And we think that that may be due to factors that are present with grasping physical objects that we just can't emulate when we provide that stimulation of a virtual object. And when I say that, I mean things like the texture of the object or some type of physical resistance that the physical object is back uh, that we just can't emulate with the happy feedback. However, we did see that there were similar regions being activated, and we think that's because we are tapping into the natural architecture of the body by stimulating the nervous cell. And so similar pathways are being activated, which leads to similar regions of activation. So just to close it out, um, I think that looking big picture again, the broader impact of this project is that it will provide knowledge that can afford, inform the design of rehabilitative practices that are both accessible uh, and op optimize sensory motor recovery. And in the future, where we look to go with this, uh, we plan to package X Touch for deployment for places that can use it outside of the lab. So maybe at home on the comforts in your living room on the couch, um, maybe even in a clinic. We also plan to expand the way that we provide the stimulation. So right now we do a rigorous process in which we find the perfect spots for the electrons. So we envision possibly developing an array where somebody at home can just slap on a bracelet and they'll be able to um, easily find the best spots for stimulating. Future directions. Um, right now, we currently use X-Touch with the upper limb and we want to explore how we can use this platform for other stimulation sites, such as lower limb stimulation. 
Uh, and that's something that we wish to explore in the near future. Uh, but also, right now, the way that we have it, uh, my focus has been rehabilitation and, like I said, with people with amputation. But we would like to also explore the use of VR and X touch and rehabilitation for other nervous system related topics such as stroke and And with that, I'd like to thank all the people who have funded me thus far the National Science Foundation, NIH, the Florida Education Fund. Thank you to the people who have provided me with scholarships and really helped me out. <laughs> Uh, thank you to the Biomedical Engineering Department, the uh, Society of Engineers, uh, the Society for Neuroscience for that travel award. I appreciate you. And thank you so much to the Women's Given Circle for uh, partially funding this work. Thank you, Leah. Next up, we have Ariana, who will talk more about the bioelectronic medicine. Uh, Experiments? Is that the right word? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm the next one today. So, my name is Priyanka Dega, and I'm going to talk to you about COVID-19 into a particular activity for the nurse village. First, I just want to talk a little about myself. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in chemical engineering in the University of Sydney, Bolivar. And it was a big thing. I also worked at Johnson & Johnson from different positions, we sent from intern and had a community in supply chains from 2013 and 2017. In 2018, I moved here to the States to pursue my PhD in biomedical engineering. I started in Florida International University. And then in 2022, we moved here to Arkansas and now I'm finishing my PhD. Following what Alito was saying, a fun fact about me is I have a podcast with my cousins, specifically in Spanish Venezuelan. It's called Algo But yeah, so this is a fun fact about me. You might wonder why do I have that why in the top topic? Why 1992? So, my why. Why am I passionate about my research? When I was a few weeks old, my dad had a so then he had a spinal cord injury. So he went from being in bed to wheelchair to now walking with a cane. So I know from the first hand how what is to have problem uh, suffering from these injuries. And I also have to know the other problems that come with this injury, and it's not only the lack of blood. So this is why now um research. So for understanding my research, the main uh, concept that we need to understand is selectivity. So what is selectivity? For that, I wanted to picture a house. So you have a three-story house, you have a living room, kitchen, garage, laundry room, all of it. So now I wanted to imagine that you have a big bundle of cables that connect the house. So you have all the cables in each one of the rooms. And just picture yourself, you want to, you wake up and you want to do your breakfast meal. So you're going to turn on your blender to just make your smoothie for the morning. So, but the only way to do it is if you grab a, a cough around all these bundles of paper, cables and deliver electrical stimulation. So you can imagine that everything is going to turn on. You have the radio on, the TV on, all the lights on, the, the house is like going crazy. And you're like, but I just want to turn on the blender for my breakfast smoothie. So this is what we call lack of safety. So what I want to achieve is like, what if we just stimulate or electrically stimulate the blender? What if I just get this outcome, the, my desired outcome, with, without the off-target effects? So now talking about a little bit of a actual application of uh, application, I want to talk about the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is the largest cranial nerve in the body. You can see that it's connected all those organs that you see in this. Actually, vagus nerve stimulation is an FDA approved uh, for treatment of depression and epilepsy with a copper. So, uh, uh, an extra that wraps around the neck. There's also research uh, to diseases such as diabetes, heart problems, respiratory problems, Alzheimer's. So, it's a very uh, appealing uh, application because you, you, you get access to all these organs that are being secured. But despite of the good uh, results that this uh, treatment, you have a lot of off-target effects and side effects due to the lack of selectivity of this electrode. 
So there's some people that will stop with the treatment just because of the risk of target effect. The most common are hoarseness, activation of their Indian muscles. So what I want to do is the electrodes that I used in my research that the mass of the talk about are called the neutrina in the particular electrodes. So imagine these electrodes thinner than a hair. And you can it's like it's that in there like a like a thread and it would be targeting the fascicle that we want to like the desired fascicle. So now my research objectives. So my big picture question is can we achieve so fascicular selectivity by applying different systematic strategies? So the first one that I'm doing my research is by the fascicular PLC. And then I have three subparts of it. So Location of the electrodes. So the location of the electrodes matters when we talk about selectivity, the estimation configuration, and also the symmetry of pulses, the, of the, the one we're dealing with in the simulation. The simulation value that I want to look at is by weight from shape. So does the, the weight from shape matters when we talk about selectivity in the next simulation? Most, uh, most common use is a square one. So I want to know what happens when we do sine, triangular, linear, infinite. Does it affect my activation effect? And my last uh, aim is a translational aim. So I want to see if the significant strategies identified in number one and number two does make sense in a different narrow problem. And we're planning, we're thinking about the data structure. Now, how to assess this life selectivity? So I do uh, in vivo experiments in bus. And what we do is we implant two to four electrodes in the sciatic nerve. So we have the side nerve is divided by two fascicles. We have the tibial fascicle, that's the one responsible of moving the part down. And then we have the peroneal fascicle that moves the part up. So, as you can see in this picture, you can see the, the, the wires of the light. So, this is how it looks uh, when we implant the electrodes. So, we deliver a, sim a simulation through these electrodes and then we collect high density in the cell in EMV. So, we put a flexible electrical array on top of the muscle. They have to know the status, the muscle effects are clear in the leg, and we also collect force recording. So, how do we collect data and use of data? So, like I was mentioning, we put a flexible electrical array to collect EMG. So, um, EMG is like the EKG of the heart, people know about EKG. So, this will record the muscle activity after doing the stimulation. Then we Collect all the responses from my simulation and calculate the spike to the average. What we do is that we average the response and we get the spikes that you can see in the middle. And we calculate peak to peak average. Here we just go from peak to peak and see how much is that difference. And we put in a conventional vaccine map just to understand how the pattern of activation of the muscle, just to be able to compare. Time and it's just 10 minutes. I'm just going to talk about. The simulation study is number one by the particular field theory. Now I'm going to talk about the location. It's the location of electrodes to matter. Why does it matter? I wanted to picture this. So we have light number one, which is here, and we have three light like number one, light like number two, and light like number three. What if I activate light number one? And uh, when I, I activate it, I can only just get more than one. That will translate activation of the pilot control. But if I use type number two instead of type number one, I will activate the red. So we'll have these three. And what if I use type number three and none of those? You can get another more unit, or maybe if I increase the stimulation parameters, parameters, I can activate more unit one and two. So this is why I believe the location of the electrons is important for my selectivity. So now also I want you to remind in mind that you have the open design here. When we send electrical stimulation, one, two, and anything that is in between. So, as a preliminary result, we have four electrodes in the same particle. And you can see this is uh, the feedback of uh, fire enough activation of my muscles for each one of them. As you can tell, we have different fire enough activation. So, yes, light we plant in the same particle can look through different forces of the muscle, meaning that it can activate different subpopulations of. So we can achieve so particular selectivity with these electrodes. This already was uh, submitted for application of the that you see the done. And now, what about the stimulated configuration? So when we talk about stimulated configuration, is we have a stimulation, so we're just one electrode to deliver the charge. 
And then we have a bipolar control. So we use two electrodes in the same classical to shape the electric field and see if these activates uh, different fibers. It actually believes that bipolar configuration can give a higher uh, selectivity. So these are brilliant results. So on the left side, you have the monopolar stimulation using the light number one, light number two. So you can see that it's slightly different. And when we use in a bipolar convention, we get a different, so what we believe is that we're getting, we're getting different superposition of fibers than the individual monopolar. Give us a um, tool to increase the selectivity of our stimulation. So the summary, uh, so, passive selectivity can be achieved with dyes in the same classical, and these results can be translated in application in bioelectronic medicine to enhance their selectivity. So, we want to target reduce off target effects or no off target. So, people can adhere to these uh, treatments. As a future step, we have um, applied this in the treatment with enhanced selectivity in the treated season with no already side effects. Um, we can also like, think about that it means the rest of the outside of the forest. And we also want to, this will help to improve sensory feedback for people with hidden humans. So I want to acknowledge the team, uh, the lab, the society of the community, and I age all that, so family and friends. Um, do we have any online questions? Not yet. Into the room. Um, so, do you want to all come up and we can yeah. take questions from the audience? We only have a couple minutes left on the live stream. Um, so, thank you to everyone who's joined us um, online. Um, quick plug um, <laughs> if you want to support uh, ongoing student success here at IQ Dark, uh, give to the Inspire Fund. There's a QR code for those who are joining online. Or just visit iqdar.org.au and uh, click on the Get to the Inspired Fund. So, um, questions from, from the audience here in person? Fair. I was curious about for your research instruments, what the unique value proposition of being part of IQ is about. Thank you. So maybe just for Yeah, sure. Um, so the question is, uh, for your different research interests, what is the value of the their Um, I, I guess I'll start. I think one of the key things that IQR is trying to achieve is making research or or supporting research that is translatable, uh, but also deployable. And like I said in my presentation, I mean, one of the key things that I'm interested in is making research or rehabilitation that's more accessible for people. And so taking those two pieces together, I think IQDAR really supports my vision of where I should be at going. And I, I'm very grateful IQDAR for allowing me to come here and, and, and figure out how to make that vision come true. Yeah, so I think uh, I did capture a little bit of uh, how the whole IQ that is like here helping for this help for professional work for one book. How can I be more you know, kind of thinking out of the box in terms of not thinking fully academically, but looking at the whole world as a life? This is a big thing for me because I I have changed to be more curious about entrepreneurship. That is why I ventured in business. So it kind of gave me this sense of new world, which is really key to the thing that I'm doing. So it's a big thing for me. Yeah, so I that's amazing that you can see how your work is going to actually impact people's lives. That's my interest in that. It's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Is that there's also a very big um, interdisciplinary component to it. That, you know, uh, there's a lot of biology that goes on here, but there's a lot of electrical engineering. There's a uh, communicating with different companies. We have, I have access to or have spoken and worked with companies that I think in a normal research lab. I would never have had access to, so I think that's a big uh, 
goal and sort of collaborative effort of I can work with other people. So working. Joan was not here in person with us, but she she is online, and she did say very nice, um, very nice to hear the overview. Let's give you a lot of Thank you, Leah. She got it over here. <laughs> yeah. We have a question uh, in in Arkansas, where out there are so out there it's all over the U.S., uh, where people don't have access to even uh, the rent need, let alone you know. Um, Higher level there. I think VR will change that. Uh, I think Arkansas is actually the perfect place to test this out in because, I mean, one's right in that there. But uh, like I said, virtual reality is pretty accessible. I mean, you can go to Walmart right now and buy a headset. It's Chris Maxwell, so make sure you go to the headset. I think that as we start to see this project, I'm just a little piece of him, of course. But as IQDAR continues to make this work possible, that uh, Arkansas is a perfect place to test it out. And um, we have an opportunity to really reach those populations, starting in the U.S. close to the backyard. But hopefully we can expand that globally and really make it Thank you. Yeah, early problems with the art and medicine and healthcare in general. Let's see, early systems have no capacity for the equipment. But they solve that problem. Uh, let me get back to it. Yeah. <laughs> so, question. Good question. But just to be online, so the question was uh, how do you make these devices HIPAA compliant? And some of that is. That's, yeah, yeah. I've been seeing some of the research aspects, but of course, that's like a business side of things that I have to consider. Um, and maybe that's something I'll be interested in in the future. Uh, right now, I've just been focusing on research. It mm -hmm. also gets into like the whole broadband access to the world. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. In the same line, how do you think that the market is going to be able to do that? What is it going to be able to do that? Okay, and then I'm going to speak how does that communicate with the other and with the market of the media helps you in your product? And pleasure with you. So the question is how does collaboration help you with your project? Okay. So, so yeah, we're looking for a bottle. So well, actually we were we were like we have seen the presentation yesterday. I we have a sneak from it at all, but we cannot do this later. Is that what we need? And I was like, hey, that's not the same thing. So I think like, we do have some, like, it's all integrated with very clinical models and clinical models. I think discussing those type of things, we can see the big picture, not just saying, like, for my part, like, they're not clinical models, but, like, they're not doing these things. But when I talk to a we are not to see that like, the implications, the significance of what I'm doing, also, that I would not do Oh, we tossed the DOS ideas. Yeah. Uh, that is, or even, for example, doing projects or trying to write experiments together. And you get multiple people do data, multiple people. So you can you know, not waste time and publish as much information as possible. I'd be curious, I am curious to see what happens when there's 30 grads and so we keep going. That kind of collaborative nature, different areas, completely different. I think that's going to be different. Uh, what's the most rewarding aspects of the research? Question is, what's the most rewarding aspects of the research? I think you're rewarding for for our project to be involved into like making that report to research. That is what we Yeah, I think for, for me, uh, the, a lot of the research that we've been doing, we've been working with this NEP project and working with people with the Linda Prince and um, with limb loss. Providing sensation again, having them feel on their phantom hands and like having to belt them forever um, is very satisfying. But it's all—I mean, it's also. I sometimes come out of sessions of God, it's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> so it's that th sometimes those are great. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I mean, as I earlier, 
Rutgers. I worked at a Fox Studies in the science office, and I got to see firsthand what people say to me in high school. They're my study advice is how they live. And so to be here and be able to work on a project that also may benefit people with upper limb difference, uh, I mean, that just makes it all worth it. And again, who I came in for, I'm happy that I get to, I guess, continue to that work. And for me, um, I would say kind of a good experiment that's amazing. Yeah, it is. And also because there's something new to make a book. No experiment, I can see that I think you can figure out, like, oh, I think it's going to be the same. Like, what? Like, I can see something that will make it go. But I think that's what Thank you. I think on that note, we'll wrap up the live stream. Thank you to all of our Zoom audience. Uh, we can continue to ask questions here in person, but um, thank you, and we'll see you next year for uh, the 2024 speaker series.